day. So if you have your Bible, you can open it up to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Also, let me just say that there's always notes out in the lobby. If you don't have those notes, you can maybe, you know, go find those notes or or uh, something like that. But anyway, our notes are always in the lobby there. And uh, uh, so I uh, believe in, in, in writing things down. Some people are visual learners. And so those notes are available to you. But uh, I'll tell you, I'm ready to actually preach to people. I've been preaching for nine weeks to empty chairs, okay? So I'm ready to preach to some people. Amen. This is going to be fun. I might preach for two or three hours. No, I'm just kidding. Everybody relax. I'm not going to do that, all right? But it has been 11 weeks and nine Sundays since we have met together on a Sunday. And during that period of time, some significant things have happened. And I want to talk to you about that. And I believe that this passage here in Hebrews chapter 12 is going to shed some powerful light on what God is up to and how we are going to benefit from that. Hebrews 12 and verse number 25 through 29. Let me read it to you today. This is what the Word says. And let me just say, this is kind of a, uh, the first look at it is kind of a complicated passage, but I'm going to break it down for you, all right? This is what it says. It says, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. And then it says, now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. And then this is our key verse for today, verse number 28. It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. I want you to tell your neighbor today, I will not be shaken. All right? I will not be shaken. That's what I want to pray, to preach to you about today. Would you join me in prayer today? Heavenly Father, I pray that as we unpack this verse today, I pray that uh, you would uh, place inside of your people today an attitude that glorifies you. May we never be shaken by what's going on in our world. And Lord, I praise you today for Jesus Christ, our unshakable King, in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three things in this passage that we need to consider today. Now, let me give you a bit of a disclaimer as we kind of jump into this passage today. All right? As we read this passage, we have to understand that there is a shaking coming to the world that is yet future. Okay? This is a prophetic passage. In its completion and in its fullness, this passage has not yet happened. I believe that this great shaking that the writer to the Hebrews talked about is going to come at the end of this age. It will happen after the rapture of the church, when all believers are taken up to heaven. During the tribulation period, it's going to happen at the end of the age. Every man-made philosophy, every man-made institution will be shaken by Almighty God, and during that period of time, everything that mankind puts its hope and puts its trust in will be brought down to nothing, and then the glorious appearing of our Lord and Jesus Christ will come as the world realize that He is indeed our hope. And He's going to set up a kingdom that will last for 1,000 years, okay? Can we give King Jesus a big hand of praise today? Amen. 
That being said, that this is yet future, okay, and hasn't completely happened yet. That being said, I believe that the principles that are taught in this passage can be seen and understood and applied to our life now. And I believe that the events of the last three months, in a very real sense, have foreshadowed this greater shaking that's going to take place, all right? And so what I want to teach you today are the principles and attitudes that we are supposed to have as believers. And I want to, the first thing I want you to see, number one, you can jot this down or understand it, okay? Number one, God is speaking, so don't refuse Him. God's speaking. He's not just speaking to the church of Jesus Christ. I think God's speaking to the entire world. Come on. He's speaking to presidents and Congress and people with hard hearts and people with tender hearts. God is speaking. And I have talked to numerous people in our congregation who have their spiritual eyes and ears open to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And they're all saying the same thing. God is speaking in and through this situation. And what God wants is our attention. He has something to say. I've read Numerous articles by spiritual leaders in our country. I've listened to sermons by some phenomenal leaders. I've talked to my mentor and others. And it seems that although many have a slightly different take on the coronavirus issue, uh, almost everyone agrees on this fact that God wants to get our attention in this day and time. He is speaking and so we cannot refuse Him. We have to listen to Him especially as the church. And I believe He's saying something to the church. I believe He's saying He's saying now is the time for you to look for me. Look to me. He's saying I am really the only answer that you have. Amen? He's saying now is the time for your relationship with me to get stronger, to be better than it's ever been. And he's given us opportunity to do that if we would simply be quiet and meditate, be still and know that he is God in these days. Allow him to speak into spiritual ears that are open. And I believe that the purpose of this shutdown and slowdown has been getting us to listen to God once again. How many of you believe that today? Amen. Hebrews 12, verse 25, let me read it for you again. This is the word of the Lord. It says, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. Don't refuse him who speaks. It's almost as though there's a pleading and a wooing from the Spirit of God. He's not just speaking to the church, but I believe He's speaking to every person who does not know Christ. Those who've left God out of their life. And He's saying, now is the time for you to get to know Me. He's saying to those, come unto Me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'm going to give you rest. If you're worried, if you're stressed, if you're, if you're, uh, you're going through something, if you need forgiveness, He's saying, I am there. I'm here for you. I want to bring light and life and salvation to your life. He's saying if you need uh, something from Him physically, He's saying, listen, my name has always been Jehovah Jireh. I'm your provider. Come on. He's, if you need healing today, He's saying, I am Jehovah Rapha. I'm the God that heals you. If you need peace today, He's saying, my name is Jehovah Shalom. And most of all, He's saying to those who need forgiveness and peace, He's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. And He's saying new life is available. God is speaking and we cannot refuse Him who's speaking. We've got to listen to the voice of the Lord that's calling in this day and hour. Because let me tell you, this situation that we've been in is simply a foreshadow of a greater shaking that's bound to occur one day. And we should listen and heed His words because there's a great shaking coming to the systems of this earth. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 and 26. Let me read it again. It says, For if they did not escape who refused Him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from Him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth? But now He has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Upon a quick reading 
uh, of this scripture. It almost sounds like the author uh, of scripture is promising a, a very strong word of judgment. And yes, there will be judgment, but we have to understand as believers that is for those who do not heed his voice, right? That's for those who harden their hearts. That's for those who who uh, is, turn away from him. The scripture says, if we turn away from him. But, but you know something? I don't think that I'm preaching to people who are turning away from him. Come on. I believe I'm preaching to people who are turning to him. Our voices are not, our ears are not c- covered up and we're not it's not that we're not listening no it is that we are listening to him we want to hear what the spirit says and listen and obey but there there is a sense of foreboding when when people refuse to listen to god and turn away from god and there is this sense in scripture that if we turn away from him that judgment can and it will follow so we've got to turn to the lord today Amen. And so that is that is our second principle. Uh, that is our principle today that 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 God is speaking and we cannot we cannot and do not refuse him. Amen. Amen. And then secondly, the second thing I want to talk to you out of this passage is that the world is shake is shaken, but we are not to fear. Tell your neighbor we're not to fear. Now, there's a difference between being afraid and having caution in your life. Am I right? Being afraid is trembling on the inside full of of, of inward fear and and trembling. But having caution about your life, that's a good thing. Uh, David and I were having a discussion today that we need to have caution around a hot stove. We don't put our hands into the fire lest we get burned. You'll tempt God if you do that. And let me tell you, we have to understand that we do have to take precautions in this uh, world that we live in, and especially in this season. So so we're, the world is shaken, but we are not to fear. And if there's ever been a message that's been sounded out by the body of Christ in the last 11 weeks, it has been, do not be afraid. Amen? A lot has changed in those 11 weeks since we have been apart. And no one can deny that things have been shaken in our world, right? The, 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 the governments of the world have been shaken. The medical world was shaken during this season. Our, they thought our health system was going to be overwhelmed. Words like ventilators and M95 masks have become commonplace. Our economy has been shaken, right? Uh, after three years of, you know, wonderful growth in the economy, suddenly the stock market drops more than, than it ever had before. Unemployment has skyrocketed. Some 39 million Americans have applied for unemployment. The fear of coronavirus has caused things that we normally take for granted to be shaken, right? The restaurant industry was shaken. The meat packing industry, the milk industry, even Hollywood has not been able to produce things anymore for a season. The oil industry facing a glut of oil as prices hit a low we haven't seen in years. The airline industry was shaken as people stopped traveling. Governors scrambled for resources and things like that. And we've watched all that on the television. And for some, the trust that they had in the government has been shaken. True? Absolutely. Conspiracy theories have abounded. Was this all just a scam? Is this the work of a terrorist? Was this just an invention by the powers that be to get all the quote unquote sheep to fall in line? And that some, for some, the trust that they've had in the World Health Organization has been shaken. On and on. We can, how many of you see that the world's been shaken today? In the last 11 weeks and two months, whatever it's been, the world has been shaken. On a more personal side, individual families have been shaken. It's my understanding that domestic violence has increased. Suicides have increased as people are upset. Some have turned to chemicals to try to numb the feelings that they have had. Some marriages have crumbled as tensions and hope escalated. Uh, The educational system has been shaken as well. Even some churches have been shaken. Hello. As pastors maybe who only look at finances may, may, you know, may, may be shaken in themselves. But I'll tell you, I believe that there's a purpose in all of this. I said all that to get to this. All right, are you ready for the amen part? 
Because when everything gets shaken, what remains are the things that cannot be shaken. Am I right? When everything is crumbling around you, what, ha- what remains and what we're drawn to are the eternal things of Almighty God that cannot be destroyed, that cannot be shaken. Hallelujah. That is faith, hope, and love. Come on. And I like Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 27. It says, now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. Now, in our day, these things haven't been removed. They've just been shaken just a little bit. It goes on to say, as of those, as of things that are made, notice what it says, that the things that which cannot be shaken may remain. You say, do I need to be afraid of what's happening in our world? No, here's why. Here's why. Because you and I are citizens of a kingdom underneath the new covenant that cannot be shaken. Let's go a little bit deeper today. The writer to Hebrews here in this very chapter is comparing the Old Testament covenant and the New Testament covenant. And as we dig into this chapter a little bit more, we discover that the writer in Hebrews is comparing the covenant of grace represented by Mount Zion with the old covenant of law represented by Mount Sinai. And you see, when the law was given on a mount by the name of Mount Sinai, the Scripture tells us that the presence of God came down upon that mountain. And Sinai, a very mountain, shook with the presence of God. A mountain literally moved at the voice of God. The mountain trembled as God spoke. And if the mountain trembled, how much more did the hearts of the men who were there and women who were there and the people trembled as well? In fact, the people were filled with such fear at the shaking, they didn't even want to be there. And so that's what the author was referring to just prior to this passage that we read a moment ago. Let's jump up a little bit higher in the passage and read this. Hebrews twelve eighteen through 21. All right? It says this, You have... Not come. Everybody say, not come. This is not about you. You want to know why? You're not underneath the old covenant. You're underneath the new covenant. You're not a part of that old kingdom. You're a part of a king, the kingdom of Almighty God. Come on. This is not us. This is not our covenant. And this is what he says. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. And he goes on to say, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful to have been born in the age of grace. I'm grateful to have been born in the age of God's love, right? I'm grateful grateful to be born in the age of, of, of grace. Because Moses later, he actually spoke to God as a friend. And it says here that he said, I am exceedingly afraid and tremble. Amen. But that's not a part of the covenant we've come to. Let's look at the, our covenant today. Hebrews 12, 22. It says, but you have come. Everybody say, have come. Amen. You have come. Now, this is to believers. Do I got any believers here today? I'm curious. Do you got any people that are believers in Jesus? This is written to you. You've trusted in the Lord. You're a kingdom Christian. All right. It says, you have come. Now, wait a minute. It doesn't say you might come. It doesn't say one day if you're good enough, you're going to get in and then you'll come. No, sir. It says you have come by the shed blood of Jesus. You have come. You have you are part of the kingdom now. Am I right? Absolutely. By faith, you have come. And what's it say? You've come to Mount Zion. Okay, well, what is Mount Zion? Oh, well, what is all this talk about? Well, let me tell you, Mount Zion in the Scripture has a dual meaning, all right? Mount Zion, first of all, is a place. You can actually go to Israel, to the city of David in Jerusalem, and nearby you'll find a place called Mount Zion, all right? But there's also a, 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 it's also a spiritual place where the presence of God dwells. Now, I wonder today, have any of you ever been at, at a place where God dwells? In your life? Amen? Does God dwell in your heart? Does God dwell in your home? Then then that's your Mount Zion. Isaiah and the Psalms give us insight into what Mount Zion is. Isaiah 8.18 says, From the Lord of hosts who 
What's it say? Dwells in Mount Zion. Uh, Psalm 74 and verse 2 says that this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. And so the dwelling place that we have with God, amen, that's our Mount Zion. And then it goes on to say that it's also a place where God reigns, right? Isaiah 24, 23 says, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion. Now, understandably, one day in the future, as we look towards the coming kingdom of God, we know that Jesus Christ is actually going to reign on physical Mount Zion. That's going to be a glorious day. He'll reign for 1,000 years from Jerusalem. We know and understand that. But right now, where does He reign? Where's the dwelling place of God? Where's the reigning place of God? It's in our hearts. Am I right? It's in our lives. Amen. The place where He is found King is where hearts have given Him allegiance. And this Scripture describes our present reality and our future hope. Let me read it for you today. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. It says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Did you know your name's written down in heaven if you're a believer in Jesus? Hello? who are registered in heaven to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, I don't know what you get out of that when you read that, but when I read it, I get a lot of hope. And I'm a person that needs hope. Come on. How many of you need hope today? Hope comes from Jesus. Hope comes from Jesus. And this verse declares that He's the one who's the mediator of that new covenant. And we've been sprinkled by His blood. Washed in the precious shed blood of Jesus. Amen. It says here that just men are made perfect. Well, how do you become a just man? It's only through the, ju- through the blood of Jesus that we are justified. And this promises us that one day we'll be made perfect in Him. This is talking about a kingdom. Come on. Our names are registered in heaven. Did you know that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you actually become a citizen of a different kingdom? I'll tell you, I'm a citizen of the United States of America. I'm so proud to be an American today. I'm not ashamed to be called an American today. But let me tell you something. I'm also not ashamed to be called a citizen of heaven. Hello? Come on. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you can see that this passage is about us. It's about kingdom people. And so when things get shaken, are you with me today? When things get shaken, what things remain for us? Amen? The things that stand firm are these, that our hope is in Christ. Amen? Our hope is in the shaken. Jesus. Our hope is in the new covenant. Our hope is in Him. Amen. So first of all, God is speaking. Don't refuse Him. Secondly, the world is shaken, but we are not to fear. And thirdly, a kingdom is being received. So let's walk as citizens. And I said all of that to get to this last point. All right, I like this part. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 says this. It says, Therefore, Since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Since we are receiving a kingdom. Well, have we received all of the kingdom yet? No, we haven't. We haven't received the new Jerusalem yet. We haven't been seen, been seen, seen the company of angels just yet. Right? It's not here in all of its fullness, but we are receiving it at least in part. Come on. We've received some of the great benefits of the kingdom. You want to know what a benefit is, Brother Dave? We don't have any guilt anymore. All that's been gone. Amen? We don't have to fear anything because we're not even afraid to die because we know who our God is and we know where our destiny is. Hello? Come on, we have life, eternal life. We have Jesus. We have peace with Almighty God. And at times we've actually been able to taste of the power of the age to come, of the power of that kingdom in this very age that we live in. Amen. 
Amen. And the kingdom that we are receiving, my friend, is an unshakable kingdom. It's undestroyable. It's durable. It cannot be moved or overturned. Now, hallelujah. I tell you what, you know, we, we honor the, this weekend the men who, who died for our country. And uh, we're appreciative of that. But I want to tell you, one day the United States of America will not be anymore. It will go the way that all kingdoms of the earth have gone. Come on. It will no longer exist. But let me tell you, the kingdom that you and I are citizens of cannot be shaken. You say, how can that be, Pastor? I'll tell you why. Let me give you a few reasons why it cannot be shaken. Because the throne of God cannot be shaken. Amen. I'm just telling you that God did not fall off his throne when they announced that there was COVID-19 in Wuhan. Hello. Come on. There is nothing that can push God off of his throne. Hello. Lucifer already tried that. He got kicked out of heaven. Come on. And one day he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. You cannot dethrone an all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal God. Psalms 45, 6 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Amen. The throne represents God's reign. It represents His rule. It represents God Himself. And then, and then not only His God's throne cannot be shaken, but I'll have you know that God's Word cannot be shaken. God's Word cannot be shaken. I love Mark 13 and 31 that says this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. You want to know what that means? Every single promise that God has made to us is going to be fulfilled and completed. Come on. I'm talking about eternal life. I'm talking about streets of gold. I'm talking about no more tears. Amen. Every promise is going to come to pass because God's Word cannot be shaken. 1 Peter 1.25 says, But the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. It will remain forever. It's unchangeable. Now mankind might try to come in there and mess up this word and try to twist it and make it mean something else. But I've got news for you. The word cannot be shaken. And then the gospel of the kingdom cannot be shaken. Amen. The, the gospel is eternal. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6 talks about the eternal gospel. It's the good news that lasts forever. Amen. Has anybody received the gospel? You've been born again. 1 Peter 1.23 speaks of the gospel by which we are born again. It says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. I'm just here today to tell you that the gospel will withstand, will withstand every single assault that's thrown at it. Modernists will might try to deny its inspiration. Inspirations. Agnostics will doubt its credibility. Atheists will reject its message. False teachers will try to take and change the gospel. The world may make fun of it, but I'm here today to tell you that on the integrity of Almighty God, the gospel will remain. 10,000 years from now, a million years from now, we'll be saying to one another, Hey, Brother Joel, are you grateful for the cross of Jesus Christ? Amen. He'll say, Yes, it's by grace that we been saved, not by works, amen, but through faith in Him. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the true church of Jesus Christ cannot be shaken. Hello, the words of our Lord, as recorded in Matthew 16, 18, say this, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, understandably, the human organization aspect of the church, that can crumble, that can falter, that can be shaken. But I want you to know that mystical church, that church which is the body and bride of Christ, that church that is made up of those who have truly turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, it cannot and will not be shaken. Amen. This is the kingdom that you and I are a part of today. And then... Lastly, and in closing, I want to declare to you that the King of Kings cannot be shaken. 
Oh, I'm talking about Jesus this morning. He cannot be shaken. You say, why? There's three scriptures. I'll let you pick whichever one you want to look up. 1 Corinthians 15, 27. Ephesians 1, 22. Hebrews 2 and verse 8. They all say the same thing. And that is that everything has been put underneath His feet. Come on. Amen. Jesus Christ is the undefeated, indisputable champion of the universe. Amen. That's why the Scripture says that every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Amen. While other religions say these types of things, that they speak truth, that they're searching for truth. Let me tell you something. Jesus comes on the scene and He says, I am the truth. Come on. When the Pharisees tried to question Jesus, tried to trip Him up by answering asking him questions to try to get him baffled. Let me tell you something. He was all wisdom. They walked away with nothing to say because he showed them who he was. And I've got good news for you today. He has defeated every single sin. Come on. He was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. Come on. In him was found no guile. He defeated every single sickness because the word says, by his stripes you were healed. He has defeated every demon because they acknowledge that He exists and they tremble and at His name they have to flee in Jesus' name. Come on. Can we give a big hand for Jesus today? Amen. He defeated Satan, my friend, by entering the underworld. And the Bible says that His foot bruised the head of the serpent. Come on. And He took away the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Come on. And one day He will cast Satan into the lake of fire. He defeated death because on the third day He came up out of the grave living and alive. Come on. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm talking about the One who rules and reigns and dwells in the kingdom that you and I are a part of. An unshakable kingdom. A kingdom that when everything else crumbles all around it, that kingdom is not even touched because it's powerful and it's real and it cannot be moved and it cannot be destroyed. You say, well, what does this have to do with me? Well, if the throne cannot be shaken, the word can't be shaken, the gospel can't be shaken, the church can't be shaken, and most of all, the king that we have cannot be shaken, then that's your kingdom, right? Then you and I need to have this interior attitude, right? Where we stand a little bit taller. Come on. Where we puff out our chest just a little bit. Not in boastfulness about us. Come on. We're nothing. Come on. But we can boast in Christ. Amen. We can talk about Him. We can say how wonderful He is. We can talk about His kingdom. It's not my kingdom. No, sir. It's Christ's kingdom that we're in. Amen. That's a biblical attitude that we have. That when everything else seems to be going astray, going crazy, The church of Jesus Christ has both feet planted on the solid rock. Christ Jesus. And let the winds blow. Let the waves fly. Let the storms rage high. Let the tempest come. Let the enemy tell us that he's going to destroy us in our personal lives. All of these things don't matter because we're part of an eternal kingdom. And we declare to the world, we stand up against the storms of time and we say, I will not be shaken because I'm a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Amen? That's the faith we've got to have in these days and in this hour today. Amen. I don't know about you, but I just feel like raising a hallelujah in this place. Amen. Can our praise team come back for just a moment today? Amen. We're not going to hold you long today. But we want to end this service with the shout of praise and with the shout of victory and with the Spirit of God rising high in our hearts. And I want you to leave today with the attitude inside of your soul that you're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And even though everything around you may look troubled, doesn't matter how dark the days, how difficult an hour you're looking at, you are going to be all right. Like the hymn writer said, it is well with my soul. It is well with me. Would you stand with me today? Amen. And we're going to sing a portion of this song together one more time today. 
Amen. Before we go today. Oh, hallelujah. God is so good today. Woo! Come on, give Him praise. Let's worship Him today. Let's give Him glory today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise a hallelujah in presence of the enemy. Praise the hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is. 